Hello, welcome to my video sample for my presentation on the topic of what I'm calling the old money way. Now what this basically is, is a discussion of a certain philosophy that originated from basically multi-generational wealth. Families that built fortunes would share this philosophy and pass it on to try and uh, make a contribution to their societies as well as preserve their family wealth. And I should say that this emphasizes the sort of philosophy of how you should be uh, spending your money. If you want to look at how you preserve and grow family businesses, I would recommend my presentation on family businesses. Now, this is specifically oriented towards inherited money. The idea being that once you have met all of your needs, I'll get to that in a moment, you are free to do with money uh, that which is essentially the most high-minded uses for it. And this is to be specifically in contrast with what is oftentimes called new money, or uh, described as, uh, uh, using the term of French origin, nouveau riche, which is, by the way, you should know, kind of a derogatory statement because a lot of people who are new to money tend to spend it on uh, frivolous indulgences and conspicuous consumption. And I think this is an important point of uh, presentation, uh, uh, particularly in this day and age, for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is there's a lot of new money being created, and I think it's important to give a lot of those people sort of an exposure to an, uh, a more classic philosophy so that um, they can avoid uh, uh, making any mistakes. Um, specifically, we see a lot of money being created in develop developing markets right now, fortunes being made in places like China and Brazil and Russia. Uh, we also see uh, a lot of tech uh, money being created uh, in all countries. We also see a lot of financial services uh, money being created, hedge fund managers, private equity managers, uh, if you will. And uh, we even, despite what you might read in the news, have people making money the old fashioned way, sort of starting their businesses, doing a better job and uh, building it over the long term. And I think uh, I've specifically created this presentation because I think it's something you don't get elsewhere. It's usually something that's been historically passed on uh, through the family or through the, some of the uh, higher social structures, if, if uh, higher is a fair word to use. And you don't generally get it elsewhere. You don't get it from popular culture. Um, if you look at a lot of the portrayals in popular culture of old money, they're sort of deliberately negative, and I'll get into why I suspect that is here. Um, but anyway, I think it's important as a topic to cover. And also, um, even if you have experience, even if you were sort of raised with this philosophy, it's a good presentation because I think it gives you some frameworks. It puts a little bit of uh, theoretical rigor about what your family might have raised you to believe uh, intuitively. And so we're going to talk about a little bit about the philosophy, uh, and then we're going to talk about, contrast it with some of the uh, other philosophies, like a new money philosophy, if you will. And we're going to talk about the kind of conduct that that would drive. Uh, and then we're going to talk about some of the misunderstandings, I think, that, that we see in uh, portrayals in popular culture, things like that. And then, you know, up till now, we will have been pretty complimentary towards this philosophy, but we're not just going to uh, be rich people apologists here. We're going to take some specific, uh, a critical look at it and talk about some of the ambiguities that this philosophy can create. So with that in mind, let's get started. First, let's talk a little bit about the philosophy, defining it itself. Um, the best phrase that you could use to define the old money way is uh, what I've heard called being beyond money, which means your needs have been fulfilled and you're now using, money is no longer the purpose, the objective, but now you're, you're looking to do some higher minded things and money becomes a means, not an end. And oftentimes people will progress through uh, what I've de described here. You, your, your first dollar you make, you're worried about fulfilling your needs, food and shelter for your family. Um, but as you make more money, oftentimes you'll start to indulge yourself in certain uh, hedonistic indulgences, uh, fancier uh, material consumption and uh, a higher lifestyle, more leisurely lifestyle. And then once you've sort of bought all the Mercedes that you can drive, you tend to go to the next level, which is, uh, money sort of becomes a point system. And so for, for this sort of indulgent period, you might be comparing yourself to your friends in the old neighborhood and showing them that you've really made it. Whereas when you get to the point system, now you're comparing yourself to your other affluent peers and seeing who's getting ahead the most. And then hopefully the highest order is that you get to the point where the money itself isn't the point and what it can get for you. It's the means to another end and specifically the means to the end that, the end that I'm going to talk about is making a contribution. I'll get to that momentarily, but I want to make one more point on this. And that is, if you'll notice, um, this isn't a progression through 
uh, high-minded sort of moralistic thinking. The, the means is probably the most high-minded, but serving the needs of your family is obviously important as well. It's actually these middle two that are uh, the, the lowest in the sort of moral, moralistic pecking order. I would argue that the point system is probably the most, uh, uh, the, the lowest order thinking because uh, even in hedonism, you're getting some pleasure from it, but the point system is sheer ego, and, and I think that's sort of the lowest-minded way of looking at it. But anyway, the means that you want to get to is uh, where your contribution to society becomes more important than your wealth. And if you get among the old money and the people who subscribe to this philosophy, you'll find that they judge people not necessarily based on who has the most money, but who's doing the right things with it, who's getting the most impact from what they have. Um, the next point I want to talk about here is the idea of class, and it's important among old money to have class, but I want to be clear what that isn't. Unlike some of the portrayals you might find in popular culture, class is defined based on who's making the contribution, not how much money you have. It's also not necessarily on your family name. It's also not necessarily on your position. If you use your money to buy influence, you're the head of a company, you uh, finance your own campaign for the Senate. It's not necessarily position either. It's what you're doing with it. And finally, it's not the rules. You know, oftentimes uh, there's a lot of uh, manners that come with some of these complicated social structures that you see among the old money. Uh, classic analogy I'll use is which fork to use for which course. That's not what defines how you have class. What defines you have, how you have class is how you treat people. And it's whether or not you're using what you have to make a contribution. But yeah, that, you'll, you'll hear phrases like, uh, he's a class act or he's all class. And we're going to get to, a, uh, that, that's kind of what that means and that's what that should mean according to this philosophy. We'll get to whether or not that's a fair thing to do uh, eventually. Um, so if you're trying to make a contribution, let's dig down into what that means. Uh, how do you do that? Well, if you're spent, how, how, does your, how do you use your money to make a contribution? Well, on yourself, the most high-minded things to invest in are your education or your skills or your experiences. And I always like to point out that, uh, you know, the most important thing you can buy with money is not, uh, it's not sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's sort of consumption. That's fame. It's not even power, although I'll, I'll get to a point in that. The, most, the best thing you can use your money for is to buy options, meaning you have the ability to spend time developing your education or skills. Uh, you don't have to uh, get straight into a job you don't like because you're um, paying off your loans. But it's also important to note that if you're raising people um, in a moneyed family, that options can be paralyzing, that in, it can breed uh, sort of the paralysis of indecision. Um, and I also get into a little bit in my live presentation about how we should think about power because power becomes much like money. It's not, it's not the power itself that's the per point, it's what you do with it. It's, the, it's a means to an end. And so if you're using your power for contribution, then that's a good investment. If you're using your power for uh, self-indulgence or self-empowerment, that's questionable. Um, so that's how you spend it on yourself. How about how you spend it on others? Well, the obvious ones are philanthropy. Are you sharing it with others? Are you giving to charity? And also stewardship. Are you preserving important cultural and social institutions or uh, even objects, works of art, uh, architect restoring architecture, things such as that? So that's a bit of the philosophy. Let's, talk, let's now contrast that with the sort of com what's commonly called, I'll use quotes, new money. Well, the emphasis is going to be on building and preserving because that's what makes the contribution versus the consuming, which is more of the indulgence there. I'll get a little bit more into um, how the spending translates into preserving in a moment. It's also important to note that it contrasts because it's not worth uh, success at any cost. <clears throat> You'll, there's a hip-hop artist, 50 Cent, who recorded a, an album that he called uh, Get Rich or Die Trying. And that's kind of the new money philosophy. It's a, a good summary of a new money philosophy. The old money philosophy is the opposite of that. And that is, there are certain things you don't do because I'm making, it's not just the success that's the point, it's the contribution. So I will not build wealth or fame or fortune at the expense of uh, relationships. I want to be a class act or at the expense of um, uh, important, preserving important elements of culture. I'm not going to create a culture, I'm not going to participate in a race to the bottom if there's a sort of an arms race of who can, who can be the most vulgar to get the most attention, the most provocation, the, you know, the most provocative publicity. And that leads us to the next point which is uh, about respect versus popularity. The sort of fame celebrity culture puts the cart before the horse. Now it's important to note that I don't think fame or celebrity is inconsistent with the old money philosophy, but much like money, it's not what you have, it's what you do with it. 
you know, and, and specifically with celebrity, it's, it's how you get it. So the idea, you know, nowadays we, in a reality television culture, that's what I'm contrasting with, where celebrity in and of itself is the end, that's putting the cart before the horse. Among the old money philosophy, what you want to do is create a, uh, you want to be making a contribution. If you're doing a great work of art, a great performance, because you've developed your skills, then that's fine. You don't have to apologize for that. But it's not the objective. It's, uh, it's secondary. Don't put the cart before the horse. Also, celebrity tends to be about being known by as many strangers than it is, and oftentimes being resented by those who are close to you because you become callous towards them. That's the opposite. If you want to be a class act, you are most concerned with the people who are near you. And the last point I want to make here, which is a little bit of a controversial one, it's essentially you're saying that not everyone's opinion is equal. You want the respect, uh, if you're making a contribution, you want to earn the respect of those who are the most, uh, th 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 who have the best knowledge and most appreciation of the best performance. You don't want to uh, participate in a race to the bottom or provocation. Even though some people might respect that and you might get attention for that, those aren't the people whose opinions you should be serving. And this can sort of uh, you're, you're, you're treading into dangerous territory because this can easily go from high-mindedness to snobbery. Uh, we'll get to that momentarily when we talk about ambiguities. So that's a little bit of contrasting with some of the popular culture new money ways. Let's talk about how this translates into conduct. So if this is our philosophy, if this is how we want to be, how do we act? Well, the first one is it tends to emphasize the understatement. It is about uh, making because as we talked about with celebrity the contribution is more important than the credit you get for it and so you want to be understated you don't want to show off you you don't seek publicity for its own sake but it is more important to note that if you want to make a contribution sometimes the media respects a certain degree of self-promotion and so this is kind of a subtle point but uh, you are understated but you can use your your name your fame your wealth if it gets to an end you, uh, that you want. So, for example, George Clooney uses his celebrity to uh, highlight human rights violations. And that's uh, consistent, even though that's using celebrity, it's consistent with this philosophy. Um, another thing that you uh, will oftentimes see is a lot of charitable donations are made anonymously. That's sort of the classic expression of that understatement. That you're not, you're, you're, it's about getting the job done, not about bringing uh, attention to yourself. Um, also, uh, let's, let's now do what I talked about earlier, where I talked about building and preserving. Let's explore that a little bit. These are the more important things that you can spend on rather than, rather than consumption. And I specifically like to point out, when you're talking about preserving, um, some of these are more high-minded than others. So for example, if you are collecting expensive works of art at auction, you could argue, well, I'm preserving important works of art for future generations. And there's that's true, but if you're bidding it up to multi-millions of dollars, someone else was going to buy it and preserve it anyway. So your incremental contribution is not as high-minded. You're actually being a, a bit more uh, selfish in terms of buying that because there are other things that aren't of that level that, that, are, that are important from a cultural perspective but might not be economically viable on their own, and you can invest in restoring those things. And so I think restoration is a little bit more high-minded, uh, a little bit more along the lines with this philosophy than just collecting. Um, furthermore, the, uh, I, I have some tricks for how you can amplify your expenditures for restoration. For example, oftentimes there's something that could have some economic viability uh, on its own, but it's not enough to justify the expense of, of preserving it. A good example of that is the, there's a British uh, organization that, that really built a steam train from scratch because they thought it was important for the, uh, the legacy of the country's rail system. But the, uh, that was an expensive proposition and it wouldn't have done it uh, just on a P&L basis. But uh, let's say if you have something that has no economic value and it costs a hundred bucks to restore, you can restore it and have one thing. But if you have something, if you have multiple things that are uh, cost you ninety dollars or that have ninety dollars worth of economic value but a hundred dollars restored you can only spend ten bucks and have uh, uh, restore that and so effectively for the same hundred dollars you could have ten projects instead of one so that's a trick for amplifying the value of your money when you're doing restoration work uh, another thing I want to talk about is this is sort of what you invest in it's also what you do with it so if you have a collection that you bury in your basement that you don't share with anybody saying I'm preserving it for the future generations, that's fair, but it's not as 
uh, it's not as high-minded as showing it off, share, and not showing it off, poor choice of terms, show, sharing it essentially with other people by, by showing it, and then actually letting other people use it by sharing it, that's the highest order. So for example, uh, there's a British DJ named uh, Chris Evans who collects Ferraris, and every year, er, and you know, you can take your Ferrari, you can keep them hidden in your garage, or you can take them to a car show, but he'll actually let people pay money to drive them. Uh, and he raises money for children's charities that way. And I think that's, that's the most high-minded. If I had his, some of the cars he has in his collection, I don't know if I'd be that high-minded, but that's the right thing to do. That's the most consistent with this philosophy. He's sharing them with others, allowing other people to experience them for a good cause. Make sure I got everything I wanted to say on that. Um, also, uh, how do you use help? That's a, an important element of conduct. Um, oftentimes, they have, you'll have servants, a staff, uh, it's not just that you have them, it's what you do with them. So for example, if you're a rock star who likes to trash hotel rooms and you have a group of people that comes by and fixes all the mistakes you make, that is effectively using help, but it's, not, it's using them for a very hedonistic, consumptive goal. Whereas you can also, uh, another example of that is if you use your staff to do all the work for you so you can sit by the pool. Again, that's a hedonistic sort of life of leisure, which is really not surprisingly consistent with the old money way. A life of leisure is a phrase you'll oftentimes hear. That's, that's a bit frowned upon. You should have more ambition than that and do something more positive. Um, so the best use of help is to uh, have a staff of people to do some of the other things for you so that you can focus on the things that make the greatest contribution, the things that you're specifically exquisitely skilled in. And so that's a, a subtle point because you know a rich rock star might have a staff that cleans up hotel rooms and a, uh, a, a, a rich business person, a retired business person might have a staff. They both have staffs but what they're doing with them is very different. One's more high-minded than the other. And then the last point I want to talk about is you know oftentimes we get into status brands and status consciousness and I want to talk a little bit about the status of material objects, and that's brands is oftentimes a big expression of that in uh, today's consumer culture. And I like to talk about why, you know, the, when the, the most high-minded uses of uh, brands, it, it should be a, a brand can be a reflection of quality, or it can be a reflection of status. And clearly, the reflection of quality is the more high-minded thing to be paying for rather than the status. And I like to contrast that with something like purchasing replicas, which is essentially the opposite of what the old money should, should be valuing. That it, replicas are where you usually pay for the status, but not the quality. So that's the opposite of, uh, that's the contradiction of this, of this philosophy. So with that in mind, that's the conduct. Let's talk a little bit about some misunderstandings that oftentimes happen. If you look at the portrayals in popular culture of a lot of affluent people, powerful people, moneyed people, um, they're oftentimes portrayed as very snobby um, or uptight, uh, which I define as meaning not sharing information easily, sharing much about themselves, or very square, which means very much following the rules. And those aren't totally unreasonable. I just want to explain why that impression might, why they might come off that way. In terms of these perceptions of being snooty or uptight, it's important to note that they oftentimes prefer to associate with other people who have similar backgrounds from the same schools, uh, family, uh, affluent families as well. But there are some reasons for that. One of them is its validation. If you're a person of money or power, you're always, every con man in the world wants to come and, and get a PC, he wants you to invest in them, essentially. And by having, uh, uh, it, this essentially comes to, by, by dealing with people who have the similar background, you're essentially filtering uh, based on validation. It probably is a filter so you can, you know, if you get more offers than you know what to do with, it's a way of, of narrowing them down um, based on people who have effectively something to lose. Because if you're dealing with people who have a, a similar family reputation or a uh, uh, similar reputation at their same university, they have something to lose. Whereas a con man, can just sort of uh, uh, use you, and if it uh, heads, they win. Tails, you know, they're none, they're no worse off because they didn't have a reputation to compromise. And a good example of that that I use is uh, recently here in Vegas, Prince Harry had some photos taken of him in his hotel suite where he was nude. It was a cell phone photo, and I'm betting that whoever took those photos probably wasn't a member of the royal family because they would have something to lose. He made the mistake of having someone around him that had nothing to lose, and they leaked the pictures. And that is one of the reasons that they might uh, seem a little snobby is because they don't want to associate with too many outsiders because there's, they, they, there can be consequences to that. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is a couple of points on uh, why I think pop culture not only 
you know, here's some reasonable reasons why they might come to the conclusion. I think they tend to emphasize that. Oh, let me step, take a step back and make one point. Um, one of the reasons that uh, old money can end up feeling very square, oh, they always follow the rules, is because it's back here to this not worth any cost. You know, it's, partic it's, it's uh, certainly not a good thing to break rules to get ahead, but it's, all, it's even worse if you don't have to. And the theory is old money shouldn't have to uh, cut the corners. And so um, that's why they'll end up being, coming off a bit square. People would judge them more harshly for violating um, certain social or legal standards. So, so back to what I was saying here, a couple points is, so why is there an incentive for pop culture to portray these people this way? Well, oftentimes the consumers of that popular culture aren't old money and might even be a bit jealous. And th so there's a couple of uh, points that they might, uh, they, might, they might like to think of the, dismiss these people as snobs or diminish them because they, the, they themselves, the consumers, have a chip on their shoulder. They, they, they want to think have a moral superiority over the people that have more and so they, it's easy to dismiss them as snobs. Also, it's oftentimes more entertaining. If you watch Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, there's always some version of that type of show going on. It's more interesting to watch somebody who's doing something uh, sort of celebrity or conspicuous consumption, hedonistic, that's more interesting than uh, here's a wealthy retired guy who spends his days um, deciding what charities to write checks to. That's not very entertaining. But I think a lot of the, uh, the classic example of this is it leads to uh, a scene like I saw in Goodwill Hunting, which came out when I was attending Harvard, and it, it portrayed Harvard students as sort of needing to prove something to th their superiority to some of the working class members who were uh, running in the same circle. And that's actually the opposite of my experience. If, if people who really adopt this philosophy oftentimes are some of the most cooperative people that you meet because they don't have anything to prove. So if they don't feel, because they have a, a certain degree of, of opportunity, they don't feel the need to one up you. Um, and likewise, uh, if you say, well, you know, I don't believe you, they're okay, then don't believe me. It's not something that they have to prove to you or they don't seek the validation of others. So I found that that portrayal is particularly misleading. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the ambiguities that this can uh, bring. We've talked a lot, we've sort of taken a pretty positive look at this kind of philosophy. Let's, let's take a look at some of the areas where it might not be. Well, first of all, if you're a big Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman, free market economist, oftentimes the assumption of those types of philosophies is that, that school of thought is that uh, your contribution is always merited uh, by profit. There's a perfect correlation. And that would sort of contradict my not worth any cost and contribution over wealth. That would sort of uh, be a little bit con conflict with that. That would sort of say your, your, your contribution will always be measured in the wealth that it creates. Um, another thing I like to talk about is, uh, you know, are we opening opportunity or lowering standards? Um, sometimes you can sort of be doing both and you have to decide whether or not the right, that's the right thing to do. I use the example of Wall Street. You know, it used to be if you wanted to work in high finance, you had to be a white heterosexual Protestant male from the Ivy League education of, some, uh, of the United States or the Oxbridge education of England. And we've opened that up. Now there's a lot more opportunities in high finance, and that's generally the right thing to do. Different people, uh, you know, it's less discriminatory. But it's also harder to enforce discipline because now that there are more anonymous people in it, they might not have as much to lose. And I wonder if sometimes one of my pet theories is if perhaps one of the reasons we're having uh, so much difficulty in the financial sector is because people are uh, cashing in sooner and they're less concerned about the long-term uh, reputation that they garner. And I think, generally speaking, opening up opportunity like that is the right thing to do, but it's important to note that uh, we have to take the bad with the good and we should be doing something to mitigate that. Also, I talked earlier about class, uh, you know, the difference between class and snobbery. While I do think that if you're, you should be using class based on the right things, basically how you treat people, but not everybody has the same opportunity, not, not on money or fame or, or power, but it's important to note that even if you judge it based on how you treat other people, not everybody has had the same background, the same raising, and knows that. And are you discriminating against them because of the circumstances that they were born into and, and effectively making yourself a snob? I think that's a debatable point. Also, I've talked a bit about the uh, discrimination. Uh, pardon, pardon me. Here, you, you, the, the idea is you associate with people who you share a background with because they have something to lose and it validates. But First of all, that's discriminatory, which we talked a little bit about earlier, but that's the mo that's almost, you know, when I use my Wall Street example, I've used discrimination as like the accidental consequence. You could also be a little bit more cynical and say, look, 
This isn't, it's not just accidental, some of it's deliberate. This is you scratch my back, I scratch yours. I'm gonna associate you know, uh, with the people of the same background, same power people, because we don't wanna open this system up to competition because then we won't be able to fleece the whole, uh, the whole system uh, as you will. So for example, in some uh, mid-sized Latin American countries, there are complaints that there are only a handful of families that are large business and they, uh, lar that own large businesses and they expand those businesses for larger segments of the economy and they support the, the political system to empower themselves. And it's, it's not just an accidental consequence, the discrimination becomes deliberate. That's an easy uh, transition, to, uh, transition to make without realizing it. And you can h disguise that behind sort of a high-minded philosophy, but it's just lip service. Uh, also, we want to talk about uh, the systems where I say, you know, there's a lot of respect for the systems. You don't succeed at any cost. You follow the rules, even if it makes you a bit square. But it's important to note that it's easy to follow rules because the rules of the system reward you if you're old money. Uh, oftentimes, you wrote the rules. This is the, uh, Mitt Romney likes to say, hey, look, I know I pay low taxes, but I, what do you want me to do? Pay more taxes than I, than I owe? But then you could always argue, well, you'll notice his company was lobbying to keep the, the loophole for his industry low. So it's, it's, it's uh, um, not necessarily a fair-minded rule. Uh, the class, my favorite example of this is, you know, if you're applying to an Ivy League school, it is considered against the rules to lie on your application. Say your GPA was higher than it was because that's not, then you're not being decided on merit. But you are allowed to put, if your family has been to this school for many generations and if your father bought a building, uh, sponsored a building for this uh, university. Now technically that's not based on your merit either. You didn't, that, you were just lucky who you were born to. You, you haven't accomplished that and yet that is consistent with the rules. And so there's two examples of non-merit based reward. One is considered with the rules and the other one isn't. And that, so that's a question of, you know, is that really a fair rule? Um, the other point uh, ancillary to that is pride, there's an expression, pride goeth before the fall. So it's easy to follow the rules when the rules are rewarding you, but oftentimes we'll find that when families are in danger of losing their wealth, uh, all of a sudden they'll start to cut corners too. And so far we've talked about sort of rules and laws, but there's also sort of more subtle social rules. So for example, the understatement means that it's wrong to brag. But sometimes if you're not known, if you don't have a family business that's well known, you need to at least be talk about yourself so that people uh, understand that you're credible. And so at what point does credible uh, become bragging? Same thing with self-promotion. Are you uh, promoting yourself because you're interested in fame for its own sake? Or are you promoting yourself because you really think that there's a way that you can make a contribution? And so those are sort of subtle differences. It's ambiguous. Uh, also, I want to talk about the, uh, what's the difference between sharing and showing off. Uh, recently here in Las Vegas, there was a, a million dollar wedding. It was sort of famous and covered by the, the news. An influential family spent a million dollars for their wedding. Now you can make the argument that they were making a contribution by sharing a wonderful experience with their peers. You could also say they were showing off uh, how much money they have. You could go either way on that. Personally, I think if it's something like that, I, would, I might be a little embarrassed to have a million dollar wedding. I would rather have a, a much cheaper wedding and give 900 and some thousand dollars to charity. I think that would be a greater level of contribution. But experiences are important and that's a debatable point. Um, also, we, if you're, we, we should talk about at what point understatement becomes false humility. Uh, and is false humility a good thing? I find it kind of frustrating at times. I don't think you should have to apologize for your success. I'll use the example of a friend of mine. Uh, this isn't necessarily related to money, but he was a good golfer. And I said, hey, uh, we're going golfing. You want to come? Are you a good golfer? He's like, ah, I'm, not, I'm nothing fancy. And then it turns out he was a really good golfer and I was partnered with him and I was embarrassed because I was always having to wait for me. And you know, you can make the argument that being disingenuous about how good you are is just as bad as being disingenuous about how bad you are. Uh, cause I found that kind of frustrating. And then the last one I want to talk about is oftentimes in environments th th of old money, the social structures become so geared towards being a class act that you are, cons that you have to be courteous to everyone. And it's impolite to criticize anyone at the country club, if you will. But the point is oftentimes if someone's doing something wrong, at what point is criticism valid? And are we glossing over, uh, cor correcting wrongs because we're avoid for the sake of avoiding conflict. So that is generally my presentation on the old money way. I want to put uh, a couple of things in the conclusion. Uh, one of them is the bad news is oftentimes even people who have old money or from old money families don't necessarily abide by this. You can see um, sometimes the, the newer generations become 
uh, indulgent or uh, conspicuous consumption. Also, they can, we can use this phrase spoiled brats. They've been given everything, so they don't really focus on bettering themselves. But there's also good news, and that is you don't have to be old money to do this. You can be new money and do this. Bill Gates is, giving, is using the Gates Foundation to give his wealth away. And frankly, you don't even have to have much money to do this. You don't have to be independently wealthy to recognize that the measure of a person should be what they contribute to society, not what they consume, and to be a class act and value relationships and dignity, and to not participate in races to the lowest common denominator. So with that in mind, uh, I hope you found this uh, interesting. If you'd like something like this presented at your event or organization, please contact me for a proposal at keithwhite.com. I look forward to doing business with you. Thank you.